you know, it's such a pleasure to introduce to all of you Professor Daniel Herzig. Uh, Dr. Herzig is a partner of mine since I've been here at OHSU, but most importantly, I know him since our training days. So he and I know each other for <laughs> more than 20 years now. And um, he's a colorectal surgeon as myself. Um, he did his residency at Brown and then his colorectal fellowship at the University of Houston in Texas. And then uh, he started at OHSU as an assistant professor. Now he's a professor of surgery. And um, his uh, interest clinically is rectal cancer management and treatment. And he was very involved in the organ preservation trial. Actually, he was the PI, the principal investigator for our side for the trial. And um, we had, um, I don't know if we were the first or second accrual side for the country. Uh, there is no better person to talk about this topic uh, than Dr. Herzig. And I know he has a lot of slides, so I'm gonna say thank you, Dan. Welcome, and I'll stop talking. Uh, thanks, Leanna. It's, it's uh, one of the best things about our what we get to do is that we get to work with people over a long period of time, and uh, it's just always been a pleasure to share this journey with, uh, with Leanna. Um, I'm gonna switch over to slides. Hopefully, you can see this okay. Hello. Uh, let me just. Hello. Try to do. Hello, Hello. Uh, that might be a little bit better. Um, everybody okay? That's perfect. That looks great. That's great, Dan. Thank you. Um, so I do have a lot of slides, but I'll go through some of them very quickly. And um, certainly, I, I think the discussion is more important. So um, if I go through something too quickly that you want to come back to at the end, feel free to, to let me know. Um, the talk is about supposed to be, are we ready for a watch and wait approach? And we can make this a very short uh, session if you want to and just say yes. Um, but uh, I don't think that's why, what you're here for. I think you're here for some details. So I'll um, add, some, add a few more details to just yes. No significant disclosures. I thought that, I think the best way to tell this is, is as a story because I think um, only through understanding the evolution of rectal cancer treatment can you really see where this fits into um, the treatment of rectal cancer, and more importantly, what it means for the future of rectal cancer treatment. So understanding the story about multimodal care and then what that has meant in terms of over and under treatment, it really brings us to this question of organ preservation and then what does it mean for, for future treatment. So we're gonna start with that and it'll be very quick because you know we, can't, we wanna cover 100 years in about three minutes. Um, because when we started rectal cancer surgery, the idea was really just taking out big tumors and trying to get people to survive the operation. Because recurrence of cancer was almost the norm um, up until at least the um, middle part of the uh, 20th century. Once we got through the period where we could just make these, get people to survive an operation, most people had a colostomy as the consequence of that. And so the next big advance came in terms of circular stapling devices that allowed us to do, uh, that can allow us to do, to do low anastomoses and not obligate everybody to a colostomy. Uh, but here, this has already brought us up to the, you know, to the 70s. So we're moving fast through a long period of treatment. And then things get even faster. We realize after we can operate on people, they can survive and we can avoid colostomies a lot of times. Local failure was really, really common up until, as everybody knows, uh, the um, Heald and others popularized the uh, concept of total mesorectal excision. And through TME, local recurrence rates became very, very low. Uh, and so then as we move past the Heald era, the issue has been systemic failure. And that continues to be the issue that plagues us today. We know through, again, we, we rapidly go through 100 years and then starting in the 80s and 90s, a, a quick series of trials showed us that surgery uh, is augmented by both chemo radiation and chemotherapy. So these are the, you know, the three large trials from the 80s that combined together to lead to the NIH consensus conference in 1990 that defined the trimodality therapy. So, you know, now we're still only talking about, you know, 1990s, not that, that 
that long ago where we're just beginning to talk about trimodality therapy. Things continue to escalate as we uh, get some really nice trials through the 90s and early 2000s. Swedish rectal cancer defined the preoperative role of radiation. That preoperative radiation was really much better than postoperative radiation. And then, as everybody knows, um, the uh, German rectal cancer, oh, sorry, then the Dutch rectal cancer trial group picked up on this idea that, well, radiation can improve things with after bad surgical technique, but if we do good operations, the good TME, and we've got a very low local recurrence rate, does radiation still help? And that answer, of course, was yes. Radiation still helps even with high quality surgery. And then uh, we get to, to 2004 when the German rectal cancer trial is using long course chemo radiation, uh, either preoperative or postoperative. Everybody gets adjuvant chemo. And this really set the stage for rectal cancer treatment for the next 20 years. So finally, by the, by the early 2000s, we have widespread ag spread agreement that this is the way we treat rectal cancer. And everybody who has stage two or stage three rectal cancer gets the same treatment, um, preoperative uh, chemo radiation, surgery, and then adjuvant chemotherapy. And we know that that um, reduced our local recurrence rates. Um, and uh, that's kind of the way it's done. And what uh, the other thing that's kind of for lack of a better word, cemented in place is this concept that you can't separate radiation from surgery. That once you've radiated, six weeks after you radiate, you have to operate or something bad's gonna happen in the operating room. And so this concept goes along with the German rectal cancer paradigm and defines treatment for the next 20 years. Um, we can talk about short course versus long course, but I don't think we need to re review that here just yet. But now that for 20 years, we treat everybody with a one-size-fits-all approach. We see two things that are that are a problem with the German rectal cancer trial um, approach. One is distant recurrence, uh, because remember, since we didn't really move the needle on overall survival at all, either in the trials or in real life after the trial. Uh, and then we over because we treat everybody with everything, we end up over-treating some people. So let's talk about those two concepts quickly, over-treatment and under-treatment and how that brings us to today. Um, over-treatment, everybody's taking care of patients who have problems from the, from the trimodality therapy. LARS or low anterior section syndrome that includes urgency, frequency, and clustering is just the beginning of it because there's also sexual dysfunction, bladder dysfunction, neuropathy, hematic toxicities, and sacral insufficiency factors from everybody getting uh, all of this treatment. And it's not minor. Uh, everybody knows that, every, you know, all of us spend as much time talking about uh, the consequences of our treatment as the success of it, because uh, almost everybody has minor or major impairment after trimodality therapy, and a sizable number of people have major impairment. So that has led us to question two things. Can we not radiate everybody, and can we not operate on everybody? And these are two separate questions, because you almost you know, by, not, by omitting one, you kind of, you almost obligate people to the second. Um, omitting radiation is a little bit beyond the scope of this, but I'm going to mention it briefly because um, it's important. Uh, the Mercury trial showed that you can accurately predict your pathologic mar margin with a high quality MRI. And if you use that to omit radiation for people who are predicted to have a negative margin, you have a very low local recurrence rate and a very good disease-free survival rate with just surgery and chemotherapy. So this is, this is um, one of the strategies that's important to use if you want to avoid the one-size-fits-all approach. Radiation itself is a big problem. Um, we'll see in, in, in organ preservation, it's not as big of a problem as surgery by far. But if, for those of you who don't are familiar with this, this is a nice tool called Polars that you can look at online, it's uh, through the Pelican Foundation, and you can predict somebody's LARS score, and it's based just on a few variables, the age of the patient, the gender of the patient, how much of a TME or partial mesorectal excision do, the height of the tumor, whether you use a defunctionalizing stoma, and radiation, and radiation is one of the key elements. And you can see that uh, the two biggest things are whether you have a mid to upper tumor versus a lower tumor, or whether you get radiation or not. And that's what makes the sizable shifts in who gets major LARS versus minor LARS. So omitting radiation is an important thing. 
uh, if you want to avoid overtreatment. And we're going to talk more about committing surgery as the second one at the rest of the talk. Uh, but for one set, for a minute, I'm just going to talk about distant recurrence because this has continued to plague us. We have not really moved the needle on distant recurrence very much at all since uh, any of these trials. I mean, these numbers look remarkably similar to the distant recurrence rate that we had in, rec in, in the German and Dutch and um, Swedish trial. And we think that one of the reasons why we haven't moved the needle on distant recurrence is that if you give everybody the one-size-fits-all approach of the German rectal cancer trial, you end up sequencing chemoradiation and then surgery, and nobody gets real systemic chemotherapy until the end, which is oftentimes six months or so from the time of the diagnosis. And so you have not addressed any of the potential distant metastatic disease for quite a while after the initial diagnosis. Two studies uh, started this idea of moving chemotherapy into the preoperative treatment uh, area. Um, these were both small trials, but they were both they both showed the same thing, which is that um, you can get less toxicity if you give chemo up front. Incidentally, I should have mentioned that the the reason why I I think the reason why chemotherapy was last was just because that's the way it's developed. That's, that's why I think it's important to know the story of how these things happen, because there's no good reason why chemo was last, except it was last. People say that um, there was initially, before we had you know, high quality full fox or platinum based chemo, that, there was, that the, tum the primary tumor wasn't well controlled with chemo. And so that was kind of the excuse that was used for a while, that you needed surgery or radiation to get local control first. And then you could talk about systemic treatment. But that's about the only reason you can think of. And there, I think more than anything, it was just the way things happen. That, that's just how the story unfolded. But if you move the chemotherapy into the preoperative setting, two small studies um, show that, that it's uh, just as good and maybe better tolerated. Um, and so then it set up this idea of um, total neoadjuvant therapy. What happens if you bring chemo into the preoperative setting? And there's two ways to bring chemo into the preoperative setting. Initially, it was this way where you put the chemo first, because remember, there was this hard rule that you couldn't separate radiation and surgery. Uh, but then there's also the, another strategy where you give chemotherapy in between the radiation and surgery. Both of these describe total neoadjuvant therapy. Um, because I think definitions are really important, um, I'm just going to talk for a second about how we define these things. Neoadjuvant therapy is anything that's done to improve the success of the primary treatment. But the primary treatment comes next. And in this case, the primary treatment is surgical resection. And then adjuvant therapy is anything that you do after you've done your primary treatment to help reduce relapse. And so this is the old German trial, neoadjuvant chemoradiation, surgery as the primary treatment, adjuvant chemotherapy. These new terms so there's new kinds of um, uh, total neoadjuvant therapy creates uh, some new terminology because now we use the term induction chemotherapy when the first thing that we do is give chemotherapy because these are all in the neoadjuvant setting. But if the first thing you do is, in, is chemotherapy, we call that induction. And then consolidation, we steal this term from other cancers where you treat with additional chemotherapy after your main treatment um, not to, to reduce relapse, but to treat to, as part of the actual treatment plan. And so we, we've adopted these two terms to help us discrim discriminate between total neoadjuvant therapy plan. And we call induction chemotherapy or induction TNT is more commonly the way we say it. Induction TNT is when chemo comes first and consolidation TNT is when radiation comes first. And of course, because it's TNT, surgery always comes last. All of the, all of the, other therapies are neoadjuvant. All right, so these are the two approaches. We looked at the consolidation type um, uh, treatment as a predecessor trial to OPRA back in the early um, 2010s. This trial was a sequential phase two trial, which tried to answer the question of, can we give chemotherapy in between radiation and surgery? And remember, this was the rule that you couldn't break. And so we had to tread softly. First thing was, let's get a control group of what happens if we just do chemo radiation and go straight to the OR. Second step was give two cycles of full fox. Check your operative difficulty, check your blood loss, check your, your fibrosis levels. 
and see what happens. And then if that's safe, go on to four cycles. And then if that's safe, go on to six cycles, okay? What we found in that trial was that there was no change in the surgical difficulty. Now, after six cycles, you know, we're getting up to 20 weeks or so after chemo radiation, and reliably we're seeing that the operations are the same. Uh, and now, having done this now for many, many years, I just think it's a complete non-issue. Separating, some cases are hard, some cases are not hard. What is very true to me is that it's not hard because you separate the radiation from the operation. That's not the reason why. Uh, and importantly, there was no difference uh, in uh, metastatic disease as you moved um, chemotherapy into this preoperative setting because remember there were some people who thought that giving chemotherapy before you have definitive control might be a problem. This was um, the unanticipated finding from this study. We, we were doing it initially because we thought giving chemotherapy in the preoperative setting was going to be helpful. But when we looked at the pathologic complete response rates in this group, 18% is very similar to the pathologic complete response rates that you would get in the old days of the German rectal cancer trial. So that was our baseline. But you can see after two cycles, four cycles, and six cycles, the path CR rate is going up to 38%. And so now we're operating on all these people. Obviously, we have complications, side effects, permanent stomas, major LARS. And 38% of the time, we don't really think we've actually done anything. We haven't removed any cancer from that patient in order for them to suffer the consequences of our treatment. Um, and so this is where uh, the ideas of organ preservation um, start to hold to take hold. Interestingly, in this study, this was the real reason, right? The real reason we did this was to try to get chemo in ahead of time. And you can see that um, when you got your chemo in before surgery, um, the five-year disease-free survival goes up. And the reason it goes up is that everybody who gets chemo before surgery actually completes it and gets more cycles. So in, importantly, I want to highlight this first group. is if you If you do the traditional rectal cancer um, paradigm that the German trial laid out, and you don't give any chemo before surgery, 69% of people receive chemotherapy. That means almost a third of people never get any chemo with the traditional German rectal cancer paradigm. And we all know this is true. This is not surprising. There, is, uh, there are complications from operations that keep people from, from being able to get their adjuvant chemotherapy, and the consequence is that their survival is su suffers from it. So uh, a couple other issues, or a couple other ways that TNT has been studied. Repito studied TNT. The control group was the traditional German rectal cancer paradigm. The study group was short course radiation with consolidation chemo. And in, these, in this study, pathologic complete response rate went way up from a baseline of 14%, which is about what we expect for rect German rectal cancer, 15 to 20%, and uh, actually improved the rate of distant um, distant failure. So uh, here again is, uh, is some, um, some impetus to try to get these people uh, to spare surgery because now you know you're operating on anywhere from one in three to one in four people that you operate on doesn't actually need that operation. Uh, same overall survival and again, same operative complications. So here again, separating short course radiation from surgery uh, doesn't cre create surgical difficulty. All right, Prodigy. Prodigy looked at triplet chemo, so fulfirinox, um, as induction chemo, followed by your traditional uh, chemo radiation surgery and adjuvant, adjuvant chemo, and then compared that to the traditional German rectal cancer kind of paradigm. And here again, you see that the complete response rate goes up by giving additional uh, neoadjuvant therapy, and the survival is also improved in a significant, statistically significant way. I still want to point out that, you know, 76% is still 76%. I mean, that's, it's, it's statistically better than 69%, but we're still not moving that needle very much. Again, same operative outcomes uh, with, with, more, induction, with uh, more induction treatment. Okay, so here's the key point kind of leading up to this is that um, early chemotherapy is thought to be, be a, 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 one of our leading weapons in terms of improving this High, still high rate of distant failure. Um, and we, we definitely have shown that chemotherapy is tolerated better and there are some small differences in overall survival. Um, but it still isn't good enough. We still need to do better in terms of getting that overall survival rate higher. 
number one. And number two, uh, these high complete response rates have opened the door to organ preservation or non-operative management. So let's dive into that for a little bit. Um, this is the um, current guideline for um, early stage cancers. And, you know, early stage cancers go straight to, go straight to um, re resection without chemo or radiation. Um, and so one organ preservation strategy involves um, local excision, is neoadjuvant therapy and local excision for early stage. I'm just gonna touch on this because that's not really the bulk of the talk, but I just wanna say that organ, that local excision um, with, ne with additional neoadjuvant therapy for early stage disease is kind of under the umbrella of organ preservation. Um, and there are a bunch of studies that show that these approaches are okay, but they have not really solved the LARS problem. When you give chemo radiation and local excision, the LARS rates are uh, as high or higher than surgery alone. And sometimes they're as high as surgery and uh, chemo radiation um, as we would get for stage two or stage three disease. So organ preservation as a strategy for early stage disease is still kind of coming along and not really ready for, I don't think as ready for prime time yet as for stage two and three. But stage two and three is where it's, is really where it's at because remember we're, we're getting 38% complete response rates to chemo radiation uh, and at least that number of people could, could be spared an operation. We've all had this experience as we do. We've had this experience uh, every now and then in the, you know, as we've treated people along the German rectal cancer trial, we, we all thought this was great when it happened that 15 to 18% of the time. Um, and it also correlated with a very good prognosis. However, it wasn't enough to keep everybody out of the operating room. We couldn't, we couldn't realistically not operate on people when only 15 to 18% of them had this kind of response. But now that we're getting into the um, much bigger local or complete response rates, uh, we can study organ preservation. This is the schema for the organ preservation and rectal adenocarcinoma or OPRA trial. We had to randomize. It wouldn't get funded without randomization. All, what we really wanted to do was an observational study of what happens um, if you watch and wait after a complete response. It could only get funded if you randomize. So we decided to randomize the two TNT strategies. So patients were randomized to either induction chemotherapy um, followed by chemo radiation or, or chemo radiation followed by consolidation chemo. So these are the two TNT strategies. Initially, there were lots of checks along the way to make sure people weren't, weren't progressing or changing. But the reality is that almost nobody progressed on any of the treatment. If you got chemo, if you started with chemo, you actually got very good initial control of the primary, as you did if you got chemo radiation, as we know. And you continued to respond as you got whatever you didn't get the first time. And almost everybody made it to the final assessment without having to break off for surgery. There were a few failures because of metastatic disease, but that is going to happen all the time. If you follow patients with cancer over time, and no matter whether you're treating them or not, some of them are gonna fall off with distant disease. But people who had a complete response or a near complete response were followed and people who did not, who had an incomplete response went straight to surgery. The primary endpoint was this three year disease free survival, which is really important because there's a theoretic benefit to induction chemotherapy of giving you better survival because you're getting your chemo way up front. There's a theoretic benefit to consolidation because the radiation is continuing to work as you're getting your, your consolidation chemo. We don't know which one's better, but what you can't, what you, what we didn't want to do in the study was report an early endpoint of better local control with consolidation only to find out at three level was better by giving chemo first. So when we started this trial, we didn't we we promised not to report any outcomes until we had three year disease free survival on everybody um, to know which of these strategies was better. The trial was reported last year and published in JCO, and you can see when you compare induction to consolidation chemo that you get organ pres that you get complete responses and organ preservation in 43 percent of people with induction, which is about what we saw in the timing trial. Right, but if you do the the radiation first, this is the, this is way even way higher than that uh, response in the 59% rate. 
Organ preservation clearly higher, um, same disease-free survival. This three-year disease-free survival is good as we've it's as good as we've seen in any trials up until now compared to historical controls. It's it's an excellent three-year disease-free survival for these this stage of disease. Um, but really, what we were after was what happens if you watch and wait. And you can see that a, a sizable number of people can be can undergo organ preservation. And if you are just looking at organ preservation, consolidation, giving radiation first, is the preferred approach to maximize organ preservation. And that has uh, stayed true over time. Well, uh, we're very, people are very interested in what the follow-up plan is for, the, for, for these patients. This has evolved over the years. The current follow-up plan for watch and wait is diffusion-weighted MRI every six months for the first three years, and then every year after that. Um, and it's, it, we do that, we used to do all these, we used to do both of these every three months, but we found out that that was way too much. And it's especially way too much if you do MRIs that often. Flex SIGs, we don't, Flex SIG is the more reliable way to detect regrowth. We detect regrowth by Flex SIG much more than MRI. And we do, therefore we do that every four months for the first three years than every six months through five years. Everybody still needs the same surveillance for their distant disease as they would have had if they had an operation because uh, just like somebody who has an operation is still at risk for distant failure, even if you never get regrowth at the primary tumor, you're still at risk for distant failure, just like people who have an, a, a, an LAR or a TME. I think that you have to do flex SIGs over rigid procto. Um, sometimes the regrowth can be very subtle. All three of these pictures are from the same patient. You can see if you just look at a, in the top left, an anti-grade view, with insufflation, it looks pretty nice. When you take the insufflation out, which is in the right-sided picture, you can see a bump forming there when you when you uh, collapse the wall a little bit. And here, when you retroflex on the bottom picture, now you can see an actual nodule starting to form. So when I do a flex sig, I, I make sure to do all three of these maneuvers. I look at it uh, as you would in, in any endoscopy. Then I look at it with the wall collapsed, and then I look at it with retroflexion. When I'm doing just flex SIGs, I use an upper scope uh, more often. They're much more comfortable for the patient. They give you great optics. They're, the retroflexion is very easy, even in a small and radiated rectum. And, um, and oftentimes you can do it without, without, without sedation. Um, but I think the flex SIG is really critical. And I think that it's really critical that it be done by somebody who has looked at a lot of pictures of what post-treatment uh, rectums look like. Here's another example. Uh, if you just look going forward, this nice white scar looks great, but on retroflexion, you can see on the back side is a nodule starting to form. So, uh, so really important to do all three, all three views and, and uh, have somebody who's interested. There are two other large uh, multi-center um, national studies that are un currently underway for organ preservation that we're expecting results from soon. The French study completed accrual last year, so results should come out soon. Uh, and then the Dutch, they estimated completion in 2020, but I, I don't have any inside info and I, and they haven't updated any of their websites since 2020. So I'm not sure what's happening. Here. But now we're left with some further questions. Um, what is the risk of regrowth? And if regrowth happens, then what? Uh, what is the risk that, it, that that regrowth now increases your risk of metastatic disease? Because that's really what everybody is most afraid of is have you, lost some, have you lost some window of curability by letting tumor grow and spread um, while you're watching and waiting? Uh, and then we think that complete response, you know, we, we're trying to measure complete response um, through our um, MRI and flex SIG, but there are other ways that we might be able to tell if somebody has had a complete response. And there are other ways that we might be able to detect regrowth. And so the emerging role of seed circulating tumor DNA uh, is yet to be defined. Uh, so let me talk first about regrowth and salvage surgery. If you look across a bunch of studies, whether it's these two systematic reviews or single site, it's pretty consistent that the regrowth rate is in the low 20 percent. Uh, some studies are higher, some studies are lower, but I think 20 to 22 percent is a very realistic number of the, the regrowth rate after um, after complete clinical response. Now, for anybody who's done this for a little while, we say complete clinical response, and some are obvious, like the examples I showed you, just a flat white scar, and you know that that's great. 
Others are a little more gray. There's a lot more radiation changes. It's a little bit more lumpy, you know, and in a low risk patient with a higher tumor, we might not tolerate that very much and take them right to the OR. In a high risk patient with a, who is gonna have a very morbid operation and a very, or a low tumor, we, we may be more uh, liberal in terms of our, our tolerance for something that's not perfect on, on the follow-up. So it, you know, there is a gray area in when you're talking about regrowth rates. A lot of it depends on how strictly you're following people because if you don't if you don't let anybody into the watch and wait group except for the people who have perfect responses you're going to have a lower regrowth rate but that's not the reality because there are patients who really don't want to and there are surgeons who really don't want to operate on specific patients and in those cases some gray area patients into the watch and wait area and and i think that um account growth rate at any rate what's also what's also when you look at sal these uh, regrowth studies, is that salvage surgery is very uh, commonly the same operation as you would have done originally. So well over 90% consistently in multiple studies uh, have shown that salvage surgery with negative margins and the same operation, so not converting people to generations or, or APRs, same operation, uh, same um, tumor control for most patients. Um, the International Watch and Wait Database uh, is another nice resource. They reported um, on regrowth rates, 25%. Uh, importantly, in this study, all of the regrowths were in the bowel wall. And I think we've seen this more commonly too, that the bowel wall and the flex saving is where it's at. Um, although, uh, you know, it's possible that you'll detect a uh, regrowth only on MRI, uh, a, a deeper uh, rectal wall recurrence or a, a mesorectal node. But I think much, much more commonly, they're luminal regrowths. This, if, you, if you're a naysayer and you want some ammunition to say like, this is crazy talk, we should not be doing this. Uh, Memorial published a, a retrospective trial of what happens in patients who um, had a watch and wait strategy versus matched controls who had mesorectal excision. This is a really difficult study to interpret because remember, there was no call here. This was, they were just doing watch and wait um, because that's what they did sometimes. And so why would you do watch and wait when you, before you had a protocol? One reason you do it is because somebody had this incredible response and you want to follow them. A more common reason why you watch and wait is somebody's had a pretty good response, but they're old and sick or, they, or, or they're um, a high risk surgical patient and you don't want to operate on. And, the, and so that's what happened in this group is that there, was a, there were a lot of people who had a higher stage of disease and, and older, sicker patients. They had 22 re local regrowths out of 113 patients, which is about what you'd expect. Uh, and most of them were salvaged, which is just like the data I've shown you. But the important thing that they showed is that if you looked at the watch and wait people who regrowed, the rate of distant relapse was very high, 36%. And so this is this one study that's kind of this word of caution that maybe these regrowths spread seed distant disease more than we think. Um, but, I, but I would argue that this is the highest risk group of patients that there is. And when I put this number into context in a minute, I think you'll see that it's, it's just the price we have to pay for doing this. This is the cost. The benefit is no operation, no complications from an operation no impairment of, of bowel function. Those are all benefits. The risk is local regrowth that leads metastatic disease. That's the trade-off. That's what patients have to understand. And that's where we need to focus our, our efforts as we study this moving forward. So this is a complicated slide that I don't need to go through a lot, um, but I'm happy to get into the weeds for people who are really interested in it. And what I'm trying to figure out by this is who is harmed when you, when you do organ preservation or a non-operative approach. And I, I'll just briefly go through it. And if it's, if, if it's too confusing, just loss over. But if you take 100 people who have stage two and three rectal cancer and you treat them with total new adjuvant therapy and you treat them with, um, with consolidated type TNT, that's gonna give you a 50-50 complete response. Remember our study, this was 64%, giving it the benefit of the doubt, saying 50-50, all right? 
if you take the people who have had an incomplete response, all of these patients are going to go to surgery, right? They have tumor left. They're going to have an operation. What we know is based on this is historical. We know that about 10% of them, 9, 8% of the 8% of them are going to have local failure because that's what the rate is for stage two and three rectal cancer after TN, after radiation and TME. And we know about, um, we know about six, I have distant failure here as 12 patients. So that's based on what we know about what happens in all these studies. Remember we said that there's a, that the survival rates are in the low 70%. This is because people have distant failure even when they've had traditional treatment. Okay, now the top part of this, the top part of this is what happens about with those patients who've had a complete clinical response. Now, we know that the regrowth rate is about 20 to 25%, which means that 75% never have regrowth. That means 75% of them have actually had a complete response. We're going to follow them for five years and nothing's going to ever grow. In those patients, remember that some of them are going to have distant failure just like these guys had distant failure because that was seeded, that was metastatic disease at the time of their diagnosis. It was never effectively treated by, by the systemic therapy. And that is the failure rate that we, that we will see and have always seen until we have a better strategy to deal with. Okay. So then if you look at the patients who we, who we were wrong about, okay, remember 25% are going to, 20, 25% are going to regrow. What happens if they regrow? Well, all of them have had local failure. Most of them are going to have salvage surgery. One of them, one out of, you know, we, we, we have 10% is kind of the number in the literature, cannot have salvage surgery. That person is very much harmed by this approach. That's, a per, that's, a, that's somebody who probably could have had a better operation if it was done soon. Okay? And then remember, just out of this, these 10 people, just by statistically, just like in the other groups, three of them are going to have distant failure. Now, so... Is that distant failure the way it was always going to be? Or is that distant failure because we let that tumor grow? What I would say is that even if you, you say that all of those patients had their metastatic disease because we let that tumor grow, that top number is about out of these people. Very close to the number that memorial trial showed. So out of 100 people, four people might have a negative cancer outcome because of this approach. That's what you have to weigh against the benefit to the other people who don't have an operation uh, and to the people who um, have better disease control because of their total new adjuvant therapy. So uh, again, I'm sorry if that is a little bit roundabout, but it's the best way I have of thinking about like, what are we, what, where is our pitfall here? Where, what danger are we exposing people to and how do we best understand that and best lower it as much as we can? So now this is the current 2023 NCCN guideline. And um, it has gone from the, in 2018, it was, it said TNT was preferred. Now it's not an option. Now NCCN says that everybody should have TNT and your choice is whether you, and your choice, choice is whether you do induction or consolidation. Okay. But it wants everybody to have um, have uh, total new adjuvant and based on Prodigy, it includes Fulfirinox as an option. Um, and once you have restaging, then uh, then you can um, have this consider if a complete clinical response consider surveillance. Watch and wait is, has now moved from what was a footnote in the 2018 guidelines. Now it's up in the primary treatment as um, an option that you can consider. The footnote now says that, you know, it should be done in um, centers with experienced multidisciplinary teams and that the, 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 this, the degree to which uh, the risk of local and or distant failure may be increased relative to standard surgical resection has not been adequately characterized. Okay, so this is the issue. This is what I've been trying to stress and this is what has made it into the guideline is that that's what, what we don't know. But I can tell you after doing it this way for um, now, uh, you know, 10 years or so, and with using an organ preservation approach as my routine for at least the last five, I'm, complete, I'm as completely convinced of that as I was back when we started TNT. When we started TNT, it was not long before everybody knew this is better. 
because as soon as you start doing it, you, it's obvious that it's better for the patient. And I am also, I'm equally convinced that organ preservation in selected patients is a better treatment plan um, when you consider the whole picture and what we're trying to do for patients. Uh, so yeah, so that's where we are now. Um, and uh, this story that's brought us to where we are, this is not the end of it. This is this, the reason why I wanted to tell this as a story is because th this is where we are now and it's gonna continue to change. This study, I think everybody's probably aware of, came out this summer. This was the memorial study that looked at 12 patients who had mismatch repair deficient rectal cancers and PD-1 blockade immunotherapy uh, had a 100% complete response rate. This is proof of concept that if we can hit the right target, we do not need to operate on patients with rectal cancer. So uh, for those of you who are beginning your surgical career, you'll probably be okay. Uh, but if you're very, very early in your surgical career, uh, I'd be careful because if you put all your eggs in the rectal cancer surgery basket, because it's probably not gonna be an operative disease for a whole while, for your whole career anyway. I can get through the rest of my career, I think, pretty safely, but I'm old. So what do we do next? This, like I said, what's really important for people to think about is not where we are now, but where we're going and where this, where this stop is along the story of how we develop treatment for rectal cancer. We're going to need targeted treatment one block aid for people who need it. We're going to have to who's going to benefit from treatment the most. What are the biologic predictors of who gets who needs specific kinds of treatments? Who's going to be more sensitive to radiation? Who's going to need triplet chemo? Who can get by with just 5-FU? Remember the Brazilian data when, when Habergama and her team started this whole thing about non-operative management, and to this day, that is only 5-FU-based chemo. There is no platinum in that. So there are going to be some people who we can even tear down treatment once we know the target. Uh, CTA DNA is, an, is, a, is a new tool that's got a lot of promise uh, and really figuring out like who's gonna fail before they fail is gonna be uh, another important thing we do. So so I, I um, forward to question discussion. But, uh, most importantly, I look, at, look forward to seeing what the future holds for this very promising um, point in our story in rectal cancer treatment. Thank you very much, Prof. Zik. Um, any have any question from outside? Submit to it. Any question from you, Mekha? <laughs> Hello. Last time, sorry, sorry, last time we did not have chance to introduce Submit to it, GI Cancer Team to. Um, could you please introduce yourself a bit? Submit to it. Count it loud. You may not name to us. So we are the Sabitua team GI Cancer Center. So we have like gastroenterologists and oncologists and surgeons. So nice to meet you. Thank you, Ka. And anyone have a question for Dr. Herzig? I think very good knowledge to learn today, even though I'm not the, the cancer surgeon myself. Dr. Art, any question from you? Uh, hi, hi. Uh, congratulations. That was a very, very comprehensive and and, and excellent talk, uh, Dr. Herzing. So um, it's not a question, maybe, but uh, I think we, I would agree with you that we we are real, real ready for watch and wait uh, protocol for certain highly selected group patient, and uh, what we. Would, would be waiting for is the, the is a good biomarker to reduce the red tape of uh, you know it's like uh, surveillance. I think it's still uh, we still having to do you know like too too much of the MRI and then endoscopy based as well. It would be nice if we can uh, have a whole picture uh, to select the patient beforehand and uh, to assess the responses during the the treatments as well. So, yeah, I, I, I think the only question of mine is that uh, once you put this program uh, or approach into your daily practice, how would you select the patient for real? I mean, like uh, uh, patient factor, tumor factors, 
you know, like, uh, would you select the patient only with uh, low rectal cancer that we can reach with our finger, or you would extend the indication to include the patient for this approach uh, furthermore? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the, for the question. Uh, you know, I like to tailor treatment. Um, and so the, the, line, the line I draw is when the tumors are high enough and the MRI is favorable enough that we can omit radiation and we can do induction chemo followed by LAR with primary anastomosis, that would be the, that would be the line I would draw. For people who are lower than that, if they either have a threatened CRM on MRI or they're lower, uh, they're, you know, their tumor's low enough below the peritoneal reflection that we wouldn't provide that kind of tailored treatment, then I think they should have TNT with reassessment at the end of treatment. And if the reassessment shows that there's a complete response, then they all get watched. Once you're in TNT, there's no reason why you should have to select some people for organ preservation and some people for not. The reality is that everybody who has a complete response should benefit from organ preservation. We like it the most in patients who have very low tumors who would need a permanent colostomy or who have significant comorbidities that we don't, you know, who wants to take a low rectal cancer out of a patient with a BMI of 50 and multiple comorbidities, nobody. But, uh, but the reality is that we shouldn't just leave it for that because a healthy, per a healthy younger person who has response at five centimeters should have a non-operative approach also. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Thorne, do you have any question for Prof. Hesit? Okay, thank you very much for the excellent talk. I may, I am a surgeon. May I ask you, if after the uh, CCR, a complete CCRT and we do the uh, sigmoidoscopy and found that only scar at the lesion. Do we always need to do the biopsy at the site or not? Question. Yeah, great question. Uh, no, uh, only biopsy if there's something that you're worried about. Uh, a biopsy of a scar is not helpful. We did start that. That was part of our protocol until we looked back and realized that 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 they were never helpful. Uh, and um, the more you biopsy, the more this, you know, the more it might distort things. Uh, we oftentimes will do an MRI and a flex dig the same day. You know, if, if you don't need a biopsy, don't, don't biopsy. One thing I have found is that um, sometimes chemo radiation will completely eliminate the invasive cancer, but there might be some adenomatous tissue or some polyp tissue along the margin. Don't let that scare you. Take it out just like a polyp and it won't come back the next time. Thank you, William Mas. Thank you, Ka. What an old sword. Um, Pataya, Horat, any question for Prof. Herzig? Hello. Please. Sure, Leka. From Horat. Thank you for letting me no patient. Thank you. How about how about the other two sides, huh? What an also and Pataya, I have seen you joy. If 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 not, I can ask can turn to question to Prof. Lena. I have a question. Okay, ka. Thank you, ka. What an also, ka. I can ask ka. Sure, le ka. Right. Yeah. What? One more question. I'm not sure. Uh, to to continue with my 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 early question. Uh, do you see any um, uh, good future biomarkers like is you think uh, CT DNA or even uh, CD3 CD8 whatever that would be uh, relevant in the near future in your opinion? Yeah, that, there's a lot of interest in that, um, and that was uh, in the in Oprah. We have a this hasn't been published yet, but in Oprah we've looked at you know biologic predictors of response, um, and 
So that might help us um, pick some of the people. Remember, the, the danger is these people who look like they have a complete response, but they really don't. So the initial biologic predictors of response might be helpful. Uh, and these monitors, like this has always been the holy grail, right? It's the mo some test that you could, some blood test, something that you could easily check for. It'll happen. We just, you know, it, it, you can see how, how fast these, this, is, this is progressing and how fast the progress has accelerated. It, it, yeah, there will be biomarkers. Um, but I don't, I think it's going to be years before you, they're ready for prime time and organ preservation is, is ready for prime time now. Thank you. Yeah, um, and I think, and I, and I would agree with you that uh, the, the next generation of uh, uh, political surgeon may not need to perform surgery, this difficult surgery on low rectal cancer patients. Uh, they, they should keep up with their endoscopy skills because their schedule will be full of flex things. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, Prof. Art, do you want to ask a question or for December for Liana? Yeah, so yeah, uh, the one thing that I, I would like to, to ask uh, Liana about is that um, as, as we, we plan together that we would set up the International uh, Chlorical Disease Museum um, in Phuket in December uh, this year, 2023. And, and I, I would like to uh, formally invite you and your colleagues, your team. I'm sure uh, uh, Professor Lu and then uh, one of the Rita, Rita. Yeah, yeah, oncology nurse would be accompanying you. I mean, to visit us in Phuket, and we are looking forward to that. Uh, in order to 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 proceed with the with the program, I, I would like to to ask uh, for your favor to to provide you know like uh, two or three. Uh, topic of your reference, uh, preference, and then uh, send it over to the committee. And, you know, it's like choose the, Absolutely. the right one, only one, only one uh, talk for each. Uh, so, so we, you know, it's like we have uh, some panels set up already. So we we would need to, you know, put you guys in in, in a proper uh, dead and time for the program. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I can I can send uh, many options, absolutely. Thank and you. let me know if there is something in particular you want to hear. I do have a question for all of you. Um, in um, do you do watch and wait, and um, how do you follow your patients if you do watch and wait? Do you do flex six MRI the same in the same frequency? Right. Uh, we would highly select select the patient uh, for these, even though uh, we do get patients after. Yes, of course, we, nowadays TNTs is particularly the consolidation TNT is quite popular. And we do have uh, MDT uh, in our institution as well, in our uh, BDMS group. And then uh, we receive patients after TNT and seem to be a clinical uh, big candidate uh, complete clinical response, right? And then uh, at the end of the day after the surgery, then we, we, we receive some uh, complete clinical response as well for this group of patients. So like uh, like uh, Professor Persek just said that uh, uh, it's quite obvious after TNT, we have we, we, we could see a very obvious changes of the tumor. And the answer is that uh, very, very highly selected group of patients, like uh, very high of morbidities, uh, advanced age, uh, 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 obesities, and those in those groups. Yes, we proceed with uh, uh, watch and wait. Other than that, we still, in, 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 at least in my practice, I, I still proceed with, uh, with the oncologic surgery. Um, Prof, let me ask uh, Summit Tewen and Watson also as well, and other side, if they do wash and wait or not. Um, any other side come wash and wait approach, do you have any other side? Summit Tewen, do you have any other side? We do wash and wait. The SS surgery in here that need to wait for a long time. 
มาสนามซอรี่ไอ้คุณดันเทียวแววค่ะขอขออีกรอบได้ไหมคะเสียงไม่ค่อยได้ยิน We, we, we use what and what strategy as well, especially in case that patient need permanent c o l o s t o m y after surgery. Very good. Right, and and, and once again, the the MRI every six months uh, for the first three years is really a pain. I I I, I don't think we we can we can apply that in in our practice just yet. I'm not sure if. It's possible, really, in the states. I mean, like in in the sense of uh, uh, insurance reimbursement, things like that. It's true. With some, it's difficult, and and Dr. Hersey can speak to it. It's difficult to get a frequent MRIs and to work with the insurance um, to be able to follow them. It's very important, and that's one thing that we discuss in our multi D team. Is that when they are in that protocol, they do follow up with us, and Dr. h e r z i can speak to that as well. Yeah, it, it, uh, patients are very motivated not to have an operation, and then six months or a year later, when they come for all their visits, they get tired of the visit. <laughs> But it's still easier to come for the visits than to deal with Lars uh, forever and ever. Um, I think we'll move towards fewer MRIs. We've already gone from three months to four months to six months, and like I said, we don't frequently find regrowth on MRI. So I think you might get one at six months in a year and then be done with it in in another iteration. Um, and uh, you know, and like I think if you can keep the flex sigs, if you can do the flex sigs without sedation and an enema prep, it's really uh, no not much more than an office procedure. But I do think that using a, a high-quality HD scope is really important because you can see how subtle some of these regrowths are. We haven't had a problem getting it covered. It's but it's more the annoyance factor than anything else. Thank you. I think we can have one last question for Prof. h e r z i k today. Any side have a last opportunity to ask? Sure, Lika. Final question. <laughs> ชมิติเออวัฒนโอสอดยูแฮวเอนอาร์สเอนิติงฮัลโหลอืมโคราชสักหน่อยมะโอเค anyway I think very clear very concise lecture I learned today even though I'm not a surgeon thank you very much um Job today. Thank you so much for joining us. Wonderful to have you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank see you tomorrow. Thanks, Art. Good to see you. I want to follow five BDMS. Bye bye. Just in a minute. Thank you.